Thank you, Mr. President. Senator and, uh, from Tennessee. I want to thank the, uh, the great senator from South Carolina, where I was born. And I do want to say the committee makes those decisions. So I don't want to be, uh, anybody to be jumping the gun on the kind of statements made earlier about future uh, situations. I do want to speak, though, to, to both the amendment that you brought forth on Iran. I want to thank you for that. I want to thank you for the tremendous work that you've done to bring so many of us on as co-sponsors. And I think it's a really strong signal uh, to Iran, but also people in the neighborhood about our beliefs. So thank you very much for that. I want to speak mainly, though, about the, the, uh, the Paul Amendment. First of all, I want to say to the senator from Kentucky, I understand the sentiments uh, that drive people to look at foreign aid uh, the way that a lot of people around this country are looking at it today. I want to remind people that our total foreign aid budget is 1% of what we spend each, either, each year, but that doesn't mean we need to look at it in a very different way. And so um, we haven't done an authorization bill uh, on foreign aid since I've been here. I've been here almost six years now. I know we have a uh, the senator from South Carolina is the ranking member on foreign ops, and I know they spend a lot of time looking at things in an appropriate way. But there's no question that as a body, we should be looking more closely at how we generate foreign aid to other countries. And, and I hope we're going to be doing that uh, after this next Congress when we begin to function in hopefully a, a much better way. Uh, I do want to say, though, the purpose of foreign aid uh, at the end of the day, in many cases, is to keep our men and women in uniform from having to be deployed in other places because of unrest uh, that's against our national interest. And so I would like to point that out. In this particular case, uh, uh, really, in pointing out Libya, Egypt, and Pakistan, I'd just like to point out three things. Number one, uh, in Libya, the people of Libya are very thankful for our intervention. And because people have come in and created a travesty in Benghazi around our consulate there, these are people that are trying to undermine what we're doing there. And so the way the Paul Amendment is drafted, if terrorists in any country that we are aiding happen to do something at one of our embassies or consulates, then we withdraw aid. And so what that means is that basically terrorists, people like al-Qaeda, the Taliban, and other groups are basically deciding what we're going to do as it relates to foreign aid. Now, that would be a real big step for the United States Senate to say that in the future, everything that we do relating to foreign aid will be determined by terrorists. I just don't think that's what we want to do as a body. So let me set Libya aside and say... This was obviously something that wasn't a popular movement. It was done by uh, premeditated terrorists in this particular... It was terrible. We all love Chris Stevens and thank him for the work that he had done for our nation. But this is not the way for us to react in a country that's trying to evolve into hopefully a functioning de democracy and somebody down the road that hopefully in some way will create even more stability in that part of the world. So let's move to Egypt. I was just in Egypt. I sat down with the military leaders there, and one of the things that we continued to talk about was the Camp David Accord. The aid that we send to Egypt is to reinforce, in many ways, the Camp David Accord that is very important to Israel, which is one of our major allies, one of the biggest allies we have in the world. So I don't know why we would decide we would cut off all aid which would totally undermine the Camp David Accord, which would totally undermine the security of a country that is one of our biggest allies. Now, do we need to take into account the response in Egypt to what happened at our embassy? I think we should, and I think it should affect the negotiations that we have with them regarding our foreign aid. I mean, let's face it, we've had decades of relationships with their military, and even though there have been a lot of changes in the country, the military is still there. And candidly, they didn't respond exactly the way we'd like for them to respond. A great ally. The president uh, was a little hesitant to respond. I understand the fine line that he's walking. He's just been elected. I understand the country really hasn't been through this process. And I understand that, you know, he didn't respond exactly the way that we would expect him to respond. He, since that time, has but I still think it should affect our negotiations and we ought to go slow. And it's my understanding 
that the senator from South Carolina, working with his counterpart, have taken those things into account as it relates to this next year. And I thank them for that. So, in Egypt, it looks to me like we are slowing this down a little bit. We're making sure the relationship that we have with Egypt is appropriate under the circumstances. And I thank the senator for helping make that happen. But withdrawing all aid would basically undermine totally the Camp David Accord, which most of us in this body believe to be something that's very important. So let me move to Pakistan. Pakistan's a place where probably most of us are most disappointed. We understand the relationship that the intelligence uh, agencies in Pakistan have with the Akani Network, and that's been disappointing. We understand the trouble we've had trying to close down some of the ammonium nitrate plants that are there that are actually helping uh, create some of the IEDs that are used to dismember and, and harm and kill our men and women in uniform in Afghanistan. So we're disappointed about a lot of things in Pakistan. And obviously, one of the most disappointing things, or maybe one of the things that's most difficult for us to understand, is the treatment of this physician who aided us with Osama bin Laden. And yet, there is a legal process that's underway there, and I think we sometimes forget that that is also underway, and there's a court of law there, and hopefully that will have an outcome that ends up showing that it's been handled in a judicious way. But let me just speak to Pakistan. We're getting ready to re leave Afghanistan. We're going to have all of our troops out of Afghanistan, or mo a big part of our troops out of Afghanistan by 2014. I met yesterday with General Dempsey. He was telling me that in order to meet that timeline, we had to move a truck load of equipment out of, out of Afghanistan every seven minutes between now and the end of 2014, every seven minutes. Well, what is the major route that we use to move our equipment out of Afghanistan? Pakistan. Now, if we want to cut our nose off to spite our face, I would say let's close off that route. Let's create enmity between us, more enmity than already exists. I think most of us realize that we have a very transactional-oriented relationship with Pakistan. It's not quite the way those of us in America would like to see it be. But the fact is, there are some valuable things there that really have a lot to do, by the way, with the safety of our men and women in uniform. Because if you have to take another route out and getting all of this equipment and material out of there, you're probably going to take a route that doesn't work quite as well for our men and women in uniform. So again, I understand the sentiment. I, we, our phone is ringing off the hook with people who share the same sentiment. And I understand it. When you see on television people are rising up in these nations against us. By the way, these countries are not monolithic. It's not unlike here. Uh, we've got groups like Occupy Wall Street that are able to express themselves, but they don't really represent my viewpoint. But these countries are in some ways like ours. I mean, you have people who, who protest and do things. That doesn't mean the whole country feels that way. These are countries that have had strong men as leading their countries in some places and aren't used to understanding what it means to be able to express yourself. And they don't understand how to operate in a society that's more open than it's been in the past. So I don't think that certainly, that certainly doesn't quell my strong feelings about what's happened in Benghazi, and nor, nor does it for anyone else here, I'm sure. But the fact is that we need to look at foreign aid in a different way. I think we've taken some steps to do that. We need to continue to improve. We need to make sure that there's accountability. What I do know is the Paul Amendment is not the way to do it. And I, again, I appreciate the energy that the Senator has brought to this body and the many good points that he brings forth. But I know this, we do not want an amendment to pass that says that if terrorists attack an embassy or consulate any place around the world, aid is taken from that country. I do not want a terrorist determining what our relationship is going to be with that country. And I think all of us know that our withdrawal from the Middle East will leave us in a place 
uh, in a world that is vastly unsafe for our citizens, for people around the world. And while I know that our engagement needs to continue and evolve, I know that this amendment is not the way to make that happen. I strongly oppose it, and I will vote against it if we ever get a vote on this amendment. And with that, I yield the floor. Uh,